Hi guys and welcome. So today what I'd like to talk about is that of the basal ganglia. And now I know that might scare a few of you and I think that's for a really good reason. The basal ganglia is very inherently complex and so what I'd like to do is to try to break this down into its fundamental components in hope of you having a better understanding of where is it, what does it do, and why is it that you need to learn it. So let's start off by saying that the basal ganglia, very simply, is this network of nuclei that allow for different functions, one of which is motor movement. And now, as you could all imagine, motor movement is very, very important. And as you perhaps already know, motor movement, if I were to ask you, let's say, to move your arm, move your leg, jump out of the chair, that information is initiated, that motor movement is initiated in an area of the brain, what we call the primary motor cortex in the precentral gyrus or in the frontal lobe more generally. But it's not actually where it's executed. Where it's executed and where it's actually regulated to check if we can perform that movement or not is in an area of the brain what we call the basal ganglia. Now, what I have up here on the board is a coronal section with a lot of different structures in it. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the coronal section, really, it's just a fancy way of saying a slice that's going from one side to the other, what we call laterally. So I'm going to demonstrate that here by just removing this piece of brain here and showing you what's inside. So if you're looking inside here, what you're going to note is that firstly, this is a coronal section and that's what we're looking into, similar to the board. And a lot of these deep structures that we see here, both the white and the gray matter, is similar to what we can see on the board. So they actually correspond in a lot of ways. So let me put that down and let me now talk about some of the structures that we're going to find inside of this coronal section the basal ganglia, a lot of deep nuclei. So let's start off by looking at some of the legends that I have here and how they correspond. So in the black, what we have are two things, one and two. This is what we call the chordate nucleus and the vitamin. And together as an umbrella term, it's what we call the striatum. That's probably a better way to go about identifying these structures. In the red here is the thalamus. Now, I hope you're all very familiar with the thalamus because the thalamus is really, really important when we're talking, a lot of, talking about a lot of these processes. Take this for an example, if I were to touch you on the shoulder, what you're going to know is that information, sensory information, is coming up through the peripheries, right? It comes up through the peripheries, through the spinal cord, through the brainstem, and eventually it hits an area, what we call the thalamus. And the thalamus is almost like a gatekeeper, or I like to think of it as being a postman, because these uh, letters or information that's coming up gets to the postman, the postman says, well, what type of letter is this? Yes, it's sensory information. And now I'm going to send off that letter to the respective mailbox, in this case, uh, the sensory cortex, for further processing. And so it's kind of doing this, it's shooting out all of this information to different areas of the brain. And this is also very important in that of the basal ganglia. So note that, the thalamus, big red structure that we see deep in the middle. In the green, what we can see is the globus pallidus. And you can see how it's divided by um, a line there, we have both an internal and an external segment. And then we have in the pink, the subthalamic nuclei. And that kind of makes sense when you're thinking about that name, sub, almost like a submarine, the thalamic, of course, relating to the thalamus and nuclei, as we already know, the nucleus. So underneath the thalamus, and you can see that there. And then in the purple here, what we have is the substantia Niagara. And I'll talk about what that means in just a moment. Now, Let's have a look at something very, very important when we're talking about movement or specifically muscle movement. If I were to move, if I wanted to move, we spoke about before that initiation of that movement. That's coming from the primary motor cortex. But before it's actually coming back, it needs to ask itself the question, can I perform that movement? Yes or no? So this is where we have two different pathways. So we have either a direct pathway and we have an indirect pathway. So again, can I perform that movement? Yes or no? A direct pathway is an excitatory pathway. So excite something. In this case, it's going to be a yes, and the indirect pathway is an inhibitory pathway, which is the no. So I'm just gonna write up here, yes and no. So that's how I like to think of it, and that's perhaps a better way for you to think of it, a yes and a no pathway. Now let's trace that out and see where it goes through to answer that question, yes or no. So let's start off up here. Now, given that this is a coronal section and given that we know that 
muscle movement is initiated in the primary motor cortex, it would be responsible to list out where that is. So just here is going to be my primary motor cortex. And I probably should have drawn that the other way around for the sake of simplicity. Let's draw it like this so it's a little bit easier to follow. Primary motor cortex. So that's going to be this rough region here. And same goes, of course, for the other side. I'm going to use this pink um, marker here to demonstrate whereabouts this direct pathway goes through. So it starts, of course, in the primary motor cortex. It comes on down, comes on down, comes on down, and it actually synapses in the striatum, the black part, yeah? In this case, the putamen. So, then travels over, travels over, travels over, into the internal segment of the globus pallidus, and then travels back up to the thalamus, synapses there, and then it comes on back, comes on back, comes on back, all the way back to the primary motor cortex, and it says to itself, yes, I can perform that movement, and that's really important. But simultaneously, what we're going to get is a no pathway as well. So I'm going to draw out now the no pathway, and I might do that in, let's go with red. Actually, let's go with purple, make it a little bit easier to see. So it starts off in the same part, of course, in the primary motor cortex, where that muscle movement is initiated. It comes on down. It also synapses in uh, the striatum. It travels across, travels across into the external segment of the globus pallidus. But this time, what it actually does is it travels around to the subthalamic nuclei and it also synapses there. And then when it synapses, it actually travels back to now the internal segment of the globus pallidus. And then it continues its pathway as it normally would through the thalamus and then back up to the primary motor cortex to say no. So that is the no pathway or the indirect pathway. So what you might be thinking then is, well, that doesn't really make sense, does it? Because if this was going to be happening every time I wanted to make a muscle movement, what you're going to find is if I wanted to move my arm, it's going to be saying, yes, I can do it, but no, I can't. Yes, I can. No, I can't. Yes, I can. No, I can't. And what we get is actually a resting tremor and we don't want that. We want fluid movement. So the question is, how is it that we get fluid movement? The answer to that question, very simply, it comes from the substantia niagara. And so what we can see down here in purple is the substantia niagara. And it's responsible for secreting something called dopamine. And I'm sure you've all heard of that before. It's a really important player here in the basal ganglia. Why? What does it do? Really, it does one thing. It says no to the no pathway. So it says no, I don't like this pathway. So it crosses it out, says no. This is what we call disinhibition. It inhibits the inhibitor. So disinhibition. So it's saying no to that pathway, but it's actually saying yes to that pathway. So that means that we're getting a yes pathway because it's saying, yes, do that. I like that. But it's saying, no, don't do this pathway. It doesn't like the indirect pathway. So what we're going to get is a yes pathway. So yes, I can perform that movement very, very fluidly, which is really, really good. And so in the case of Parkinson's patients, what you're going to find is that there is a significant decrease in uh, dopamine um, producing neurons inside the substantial niagara. So what that's going to mean is that, well, if we don't have dopamine in the case of Parkinson's patients, they can't regulate this yes and no pathway. So instead they're getting yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And that's what we call a resting tremor. And that's really, really important.